All right, hello everybody. Welcome to your online version of Chapter 17, the Reproductive System. As you can see over here on our title slide, we've got male reproductive system and our female reproductive system. Talk a little bit about these structures and also some physiology going on in these reproductive systems um, for this chapter. So per usual, here's your learning objectives for this chapter. Um, a little bit about mitosis, meiosis, chromosomes at the start. A little bit of, um, hopefully, review. Describing spermatogenesis, oogenesis, um, structures of our spermatozoa, so on and so forth. I'm going to have a little more information on spermatogenesis in here than is in your book. Uh, I've pulled that from some stuff in the reproduction book uh, and a little lecture I've given um, in the past. All right, we'll also talk about ovarian estrous cycles and just quickly touch on some species that have different um, types of estrous cycles. All right, first and foremost, just a quick review on chromosomes. Chromosomes are obviously um, our DNA um, in coiled form within the nucleus of all our mammalian cells. All of our cells have two um, copies of all of the chromosomes, um, the only exceptions of this being um, our gametes, our sperm spermatogonia, and uh, oogonia, or oocytes. Diploid number of chromosomes is the total number of chromosomes in a normal cell. Uh, for example, humans, we have 23 chromosomes. Each one is in paired form, so we have a diploid number of 46 in the human. All right, I'd like you to take a look at a uh, table in your book, 17.1. It gives some diploid chromosome numbers for um, various species, uh, something you might want to be familiar with when it comes to the final exam in a couple weeks. Right. There's always an even number um, in this table for these diploid chromosome numbers because obviously if anything is in paired form, whether an odd number or an even number, when you multiply by two, always going to get an even number. All right. So the only chromosomes that um, are kind of special are our sex chromosomes. All our other chromosomes are called autosomes. Uh, sex chromosomes being your X and your Y. Um, all males are genetically XY, so they have one X and one Y chromosome, and all females are genetically XX. Your X chromosomes contain slightly more DNA content than your Y chromosomes. Uh, this is actually pretty important when we're talking um, animals because we can utilize this information um, when we're looking to select sperm for artificial insemination in cows um, or other species where we can stain the DNA content of our cells and run it through a flow cytometer and essentially if we see more fluorescent from our stain um, we can determine that those are X bearing sperm we can sort those from our Y bearing sperm and we can have semen straws that are about 90 percent effective for selecting for X sperm um, because if we're talking the dairy industry we'd love to have um, female replacement animals with our matings so if we're doing artificial insemination why not utilize something that has mostly X sperm to try and get female replacements alright so a little bit more on the chromosomes uh, your haploid chromosome number is <coughs> Uh, your N number as opposed to 2N and your haploid cells are going to be your daughter cells from spermatogenesis and oogenesis so your spermatozoa uh, and your oocytes it's important that chromosome number is halved in these cell types because at fertilization when sperm fertilizes the egg obviously we want to add all of our DNA together and if we if both cells had the full complement of DNA we would have twice as many copies of the chromosomes that a normal organism would have in all their cells so during spermatogenesis and oogenesis uh, these numbers are cut in half so that when fusion occurs at fertilization um, those two halves can make one whole set of chromosomes uh, for your resulting offspring chromosome number is halved during meiosis in both of these processes so quick review here on mitosis. Um, everybody hopefully has had some of this in biology, um, so on and so forth. But we have four phases of mitosis. Um, this particular figure 
adds a fifth phase pro pre pro meta phase um, but for the most part um, your four stages of mitosis are generally thought of as prophase metaphase anaphase and telophase so pmat all right in prophase we have the nuclear envelope starting to uh, break apart and your chromosomes are condensing they're actually initially in a relaxed chromatin state but they condense into these um, traditional um, chromosome formations and your nuclear envelope is um, starting to regress in metaphase we have alignment of our chromosomes along the metaph metaphasal plates the equator of the cell and this is important because we're going to pull these chromosomes apart to either side of the cell um, in our next phase of mitosis you can see spindle fibers um, starting to form as well these are what are going to actually pull apart the chromosomes um, anaphase we're actually separating our chromosomes so spindle fibers are retracting um, pulling one half of the chromosome to this side of the cell one half of the chromosome over to this side of the cell All right, this is important so that we can have the chromosome number in our resulting cells um, <clears throat> for oogenesis and spermatogenesis because um, these stages are very similar in meiosis here in mitosis um, we're getting the same DNA content uh, because we've done this process after DNA replication um, but the same exact phases happen in uh, meiosis as well the telophase the chromosomes relax back to our relaxed chromatin state the nuclear envelope starts to reappear around the nuclear content and we're getting cleavage um, furrows developed so that the cell divides into two cells with half the DNA content on one side half on the other side alright so a little bit about meiosis um, spermatogenesis and oogenesis we have a uh, couple rounds of meiosis um, first round um, has some DNA replication and recombination as if you'd see before mitosis um, so we're duplicating our DNA and then pulling apart our paired chromosomes um, and we're still at diploid um, DNA content at the end of meiosis 1 meiosis 2 however we do not have our DNA replication um, <clears throat> and then we pull apart our chromosomes and we get haploid um, resulting cells down here at the end of spermatogenesis we will have four cells here at the end of meiosis these are actually going to be round spermatid um, cells at this point in the process and all four of these cells here are going to be usable and viable spermatozoa obviously there can be other defects with spermatozoa and so on and so forth but these all all four of these have potential um, to become viable spermatozoa when this process occurs in oogenesis um, only one of these is selected for and grows larger than the others and can be um, an actual mature oocyte the other three will be smaller polar bodies that will eventually regress alright so let's talk a little bit about spermatogenesis um, I'll, also for this lecture um, if there were a few blanks within the lecture um, I decided to fill these in for you guys um, in this video with um, bold underlined words where the blanks previously were so you can if you're taking notes fill those bad boys in right now with these words such as seminiferous tubules up here um, and I'll probably post a list of blanks um, on Sakai as well alright spermatogenesis taking place in the seminiferous tubules seminiferous tubules are located within the testes um, tons of seminiferous tubules all wound up within the testes we'll look at a diagram of that in the next slide and throughout the spermatogenesis so throughout spermatogenesis we have various cell types um, starting at the beginning of the process all the way till we get to spermatozoa all right, initially we have undifferent undifferentiated stem cells um, which are going to become our spermatogonia then spermatogonia undergo some mitotic divisions um, to produce spermatocytes spermatocytes um, come in primary and secondary forms and spermatocytes undergo meiotic divisions um, to form our round spermatids at this point this is where our cells are going to be haploid um, everywhere else uh, they're still diploid until we get to our secondary spermatocytes I guess um, so, so round spermatids is where we have haploid cells right here 
brown spermatids um, then undergo just a series of morphological changes um, to get to your traditional looking spermatozoa. So it's a round, usually perfectly round cell, no flagella or anything. Um, we end up condensing the nucleus, making a more um, fluid oval shaped head. Uh, it's actually very flat and then getting a flagella extending off of that. And We'll go into those processes in a few minutes until we eventually get our fully developed spermatozoa. At the end of spermatogenesis within the seminiferous tubule, spermatozoa are not capable of fertilizing the egg. They're not fully developed. They need to go undergo some maturation within the epididymis and then there's a reaction that needs to occur in the female reproductive tract as well before they can actually penetrate the, um, the egg. There's a lot of mitosis and meiosis going on in spermatogenesis. Goals of spermatogenesis, um, obviously we want to produce the male gametes. Uh, we want to produce billions of these per day. Uh, also giving um, a location within the body uh, where we're away from the immune system. The immune system would target uh, sperm cells and destroy them if uh, if it could access them, but we have a blood testis barrier that keeps them protected. Um, also genetic diversity. Um, spermatozoa have what we like to call the snowflake effect, you know, no two snowflakes are ever exactly identical. Same thing happens with spermatozoa. We have a lot of crossing over um, in some of our stages where DNA is traded between chromosomes. And when this occurs, we make sure that we have no two spermatozoa that are um, exactly the same. All right, so some schematics that I pulled in from outside of your book uh, in the process of spermatogenesis. We've got our seminiferous tubules right here. We're pulling this out of uh, the testes or the testicle right here. And this is a cross section. Along the outside of the structure, we have the basement membrane. These are where your um, stem cells are that are utilized for spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis actually takes place inward in the seminiferous tubules. So we have the basement membrane here. It takes inward into the opening of the tubule, which is called the lumen. All right, so you can start to see flagella in here um, once we start to get elongated spermatids and uh, to spermatozoa. So a little close up here, you've got your spermatogonia over here, mitosis occurring, and we're getting primary spermatocytes, sper spermatocytes undergoing meiosis, secondary spermatocytes, uh, more meiosis down to our round spermatids, and round spermatids here start to undergo morphological changes, um, you know, forming the tail, you can see the start of one right there, forming the tail, um, condensing the head, and getting to the point where we have our spermatozoa here. It has an acrosome, um, a tail, uh, the spermatozoa have three um, main portions. We have a head, which is the nucleus with the acrosome and postnuclear cap, the midpiece, which is this orangish yellow part right there, and then the tail, which is the rest of the flagella. All right, so spermatogenesis separated into three phases. We've got a proliferation phase, meiotic phase, and differentiation phase. Proliferation phase, we're talking about your starting cells being spermatogonia, undergoing several rounds of mitosis. All right, the number of rounds of mitosis uh, varies uh, across different species. So we can produce more and more or less cells, depending on what species we're talking about. Meiotic phase, we have meiotic divisions. We're starting with our spermatocytes here. Um, we're undergoing a couple rounds of meiosis, and our result will be our round spermatids, uh, which will enter our differentiation phase, in which no cell division is taking place. We have our number of cells for this part of spermatogenesis that are going to become spermatozoa, and we form our flagella, alter the shape of the head, um, and add a couple extra structures um, to the sperm. So you can see here, once again, picture of seminiferous tubule. These pink cells here are Sertoli cells. All right, they're very important in spermatogenesis. Um, they aid the process and all of these sp spermatogenic cells, you know, your spermatogonia, spermatocytes, so on and so forth, are in between all of these Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells are nurse cells for this process um, that help the entire process. Outside of the seminiferous tubules, you can see our interstitial cells. 
Um, these are our Leydig cells. We talked about those a little bit in uh, the endocrine chapter. They help produce um, androgens, you know, testosterone, and such to aid in this process uh, over here in the seminiferous tubules. All right, schematic from your reproduction book. Those of you taking it next year, year after. Um, <coughs> this is a picture of spermatogenesis laid out in flowchart form. Um, so at the basement membrane here, we have our spermatogonia. Spermatogonia undergo mitotic divisions, several rounds based on species. Um, this can vary. And it's important to note that in the f beginning stages of these mitotic divisions in the proliferation phase, some of these cells will actually, the spermatogonia, will revert back to um, the original stem cells. And this is very important because um, we need a continual supply of those original cells so that this process um, can continue to occur um, throughout the animal's lifetime to an extent. All right, males can produce sperm uh, for a lot longer than females um, can produce eggs. Um, also, these black cells here, um, this is an example of um, cells undergoing apoptosis, so some of these cells are going to die. So even though every time you do a division, you should get two resulting cells um, to the point where you can potentially get up to 256 um, spermatids at the end of this process after mitotic and meiotic divisions from one original spermatogonia. However, you're not actually ever going to get 256 because some are going to undergo apoptosis. A couple of them are going to revert back to stem cells and not continue to divide. Um, but there's potential from one spermatogonia um, to get many, many round spermatids, um, which will result in many, many um, spermatozoa, of course. <coughs> Just some summary slides of these three phases. Proliferation phase, you know, the where, why, and, and how. Um, where in the basal compartment, all right, so near the basement membrane. Cells we're talking about are spermatogonia undergoing the mitosis. Uh, mitosis is our um, cell division. A lot of stem cell renewal because we need continuous supply of those original cells. Apoptosis, some of the cells are dying off. We get lots and lots of uh, diploid primary spermatocytes at the end of the pro proliferation phase. All right, meiotic phase <coughs> takes place in the adluminal compartment, so we're getting uh, more towards the lumen. Taking our primary spermatocytes and our secondary spermatocytes are going my meiosis, meiosis 1 and 2, give you a little bit of timeline and um, how long these take in the bull. Meiosis 1, a lot longer because there's DNA replication and crossing over occurring. Uh, meiosis 2, no DNA replication. Um, at the end of meiosis 2, we have our haploid um, cells, and these are going to be our round spermatids. Differentiation phase, this is just a morphological conversion of our round spermatid into our spermatozoa. Differentiation phase itself is separated into four different phases. We've got the Golgi phase, cap phase, acrosomal phase, and maturation phase. We'll talk briefly about these moving forward. Uh, a little more information um, than your current textbook gives you, but this is kind of going to give you a little bit of a head start as you get into reproduction. You'll talk about this in a lot more detail. Um, <clears throat> all right, so once again, a couple diagrams from your reproduction book. I put the title of this book at the end of the slide, give it a little credit. Um, <clears throat> this would be the Golgi phase of um, the differentiation phase of spermatogenesis, and essentially we have Golgi apparatus, um, like you would find in normal cells, um, migrates to a spot on the nucleus, and we have these granules. Um, from your Golgi apparatus that end up becoming um, your acrosomic vesicle which will fuse to your nucleus here at the top and this is what's going to be the start of forming the acrosome uh, which is very important. Also in the Golgi phase the centrioles um, end up migrating to the opposite end of the nucleus here and your proximal centriole and distal centriole um, those are going to essentially give rise to the flage flagella uh, for the sperm cell, which is obviously very important um, for tail formation, for motility, to uh, try and get over to the oocytes. All right, your next three phases, the cap phase. So the cap we're referring to here is um, the acrosome. Um, the acrosomic vesicle here is starting to flatten out and start to extend over the nucleus. All right, this is the initiation of your acrosome formation. Your Golgi apparatus 
ends up going to the what's going to end up being now the caudal end of this cell um, over where the centrioles migrated to and that's going to eventually regress. Um, your centrioles here are starting to um, have their filaments elongates and start production of the flagella. In the acrosomal phase, the acrosome continues to spread until it's covering approximately two-thirds of the anterior portion of the nucleus. And from here, we've got more extension of our flagella. And then we get into the maturation phase. The part of the nucleus that the acrosome does not cover um, gets covered by what we call the postnuclear cap. So right in here, we've got postnuclear cap coverage. As you can see, head is starting to elongate a lot in this stage. Um, a lot of your cytoplasm uh, is removed via those uh, Sertoli cells. And these purple structures here, those are our mitochondria. Mitochondria are migrating to the middle of the tail during the maturation phase. And this is very, very important. They end up forming a spiral structure, um, which makes up the midpiece of the sperm. And like we all know, the mitochondria are producing energy in normal cells. And that's exactly what they do here in our spermatozoa. They um, essentially power motility of the flagella. So movement of the flagella um, to get the spermatozoa to uh, be modal. So our three regions of our sperm when we're finally done here are the head, the midpiece, which has all our mitochondria, and the tail or the uh, principal piece. At this point, um, these spermatozoa are not quite ready. The acrosome needs to undergo some enzymatic reactions in the female reproductive tract before it can actually uh, stick to and penetrate um, the oocyte. Sit down, Doug. All right, a little bit about oogenesis. Not going to go into as much detail as spermatogenesis. Um, I like to pull in that some of that spermatogenesis stuff um, from your other book. But oogenesis, we're going to keep it pretty basic. Uh, obviously, we're producing ovum. This process occurs in ovarian follicles. And there, the number of oocytes, the primary oocytes that a female has for their lifetime is um, fully determined, and they're all developed um, by the time of birth or shortly after birth um, of the female. So the finite number of oocytes, once the female runs out, um, then there's no more oocytes for reproduction. So we have primary oocytes, they end up dividing via meiosis. We get a secondary oocyte in a polar body. Um, the secondary oocyte is the one that is selected for. It is um, much larger than the polar body and will eventually um, lead to um, a potentially functional oocyte. Right. The secondary oocyte and polar body will also divide. And this division results in three polar bodies in total and one ovum. So you can see a little schem schematic of this. We've got um, oogenesis over here, spermatogenesis over here. We've got our primary sp oocytes dividing to our secondary um, and our polar body. The secondary will divide itself um, to get your one selected for ovum and a new polar body. The polar body separates into, divides into two new polar bodies. These three polar bodies are eventually going to regress. Um, these are essentially trash cans for the excess DNA content um, when we're going from diploid to haploid because at the end here we have a nice haploid um, ovum so these are going to regress they're not going to um, become fertilizable uh, ovum so this one ovum from a primary oocyte is all you get as opposed to spermatogenesis where once we have our primary spermatocyte um, through our cell divisions here our meiotic divisions we end up with four potentially fully functioning spermatozoa from this process. So a little bit of difference between oogenesis and sperm spermatogenesis is what you get out of your initial cell. Alright, we've gone over a little bit about spermatogenesis and oogenesis. So let's talk about um, structures and functions of these systems in general. Um, so here obviously we have a schematic of your male reproductive system. Um, one of those obviously awesome label diagrams for your exam. Um, three main functions. We have to obviously produce hormones. Hormones control um, everything that goes on um, in this system, including spermatogenesis. Uh, spermatogenesis, goal number two, producing spermatozoa um, for uh, breeding and fertilization. 
and obviously we need to deliver those spermatozoa to the female all right, during breeding. Testes, where um, spermatogenesis occurs, um, also production of hormones, so our Leydig cells, our interstitial cells producing uh, some of our androgens. Uh, we locate it in the inguinal region and housed in the scrotum, so the scrotum would be here once uh, animal is developed and testes have descended. Uh, the inguinal region, uh, there's an inguinal ring which is essentially um, a ring or a hole structure um, in between abdominal muscle and this allows the testes to descend um, to be housed a little externally um, compared to the main trunk of the body. Um, this is important for um, temperature control. Um, blood in the testes is actually at a slightly lower temperature than the rest of the body um, because this is necessary for the environment for spermatogenesis. All right, during development when an animal is growing the testes are actually in the fetus are actually developing near the kidneys however when the animal starts to develop and grow larger it is connected to some connective tissue called the gubernaculum and this connection um, pulls the testes caudally and ventrally during development as the fetus grows and that's when the testes get out to the um, outer portion of the body where they'll eventually descend through the inguinal ring and be housed in the scrotum. The scrotum, very simple, a uh, sack of skin that houses the testes, uh, very important for temperature regulation, housing these away from the body like I already said, um, slightly cooler than the regular body temperature, which is important for spermatogenesis, um, and there's this cremaster muscle that can help change the position of the testes, basically um, retract and pull the testes closer to the body when it's very cold to keep them warm enough um, and relax when it's really warm um, so the testes can hang a little lower away from the body because it's very warm to uh, regulate temperature because temperature regulation once again very important. Alright, spermatic cord is your connection with the testes to the rest of the body. It's going to include a bunch of things um, like a lot of our structures we've talked about this semester, blood and lymph vessels are going to travel through here, um, also nerves, and we're going to have the vas deferens. All right, we'll talk about the vas deferens in a few slides. Uh, the pampiniform plexus um, is your complex network of veins here in the spermatic cord, and these are actually surrounding um, the artery that's going to bring blood to the testis or testes. The artery brings blood to the testes um, at normal body temperature. However, it's wrapped around these veins, and these veins are bringing blood back from the descended testes. So at the descension down here, we have cooler temperatures, so the blood has cooled at this point. So the veins are bringing cooler blood back and are wrapped around the artery over here. This is going to cool the blood in the artery as it comes down to the testes, to make sure it's at proper temperature um, to not disrupt spermatogenesis. At the same time, because the arterial blood here is warmer as blood's traveling up through the veins, there's kind of dual transfer of temperature here because the artery starts to warm this blood as it's coming back up to the main body and eventually going to go back to the heart because it wants it at the temperature that all the blood here, blood is at over here in uh, the main body. So you've got the veins cooling the blood in the artery as it comes down to the testes and the artery at the same time warming the blood in the veins as it travels up. Um, so very important temperature regulation for blood as it's traveling to and from the testes. All right, we have various connective tissue um, tunics that, that form layers around the testes and somatic cord. We've got the visceral vaginal tunic um, is a really thin inner layer parietal vaginal tunic, uh, the thicker outer layer, and you've got the uh, tunica albuginea, um, which is a capsule that surrounds each testes, uh, each testicle um, below your tunics. So these are just some layers of connective tissue that uh, surround the testes. Uh, we have a very complex duct system <coughs> that essentially, you know, gets your spermatozoa within the system, 
and allows it to travel um, over to where it needs to go during ejaculation to exit the male and enter the female reproductive tract. All right, spermatozoa, they're closely, um, closely knit with your Sertoli cells in those um, seminiferous tubules. So they're going to leave the housing of those Sertoli cells um, and enter the duct system. All right, in the duct system, you're going to have your reedy testes, your um, afferent ducts, and your epididymis. The epididymis is a very important structure. Uh, houses your spermatozoa and also uh, some maturation occurs in the epididymis that is necessary to make your spermatozoa fully functional. Epididymis has uh, three different regions, the head, the body, and the tail. Um, the head, um, we can see it a little better in a different picture, but is where it comes out of the testes. The, the body is where it starts to wrap around the side of the testicle and the tail is the extension of the epididymis that eventually um, runs into the vas deferens. All right, so vas deferens also known as ductus deferens. Vas deferens is the transport system bringing your spermatozoa um, up to the urethra uh, from the testes during ejaculation. All right. This structure obviously has to go through the inguinal ring because it's coming from the testes and going um, into the main portion of the body. Um, it runs along with your arteries and veins and nerves and such at first, and then it does separate off from those portions of the somatic cord and travels over to the urethra. Right, this is going to join the urethra just past the neck of the bladder. We talked about the bladder um, last couple lectures in the urinary system. And the enlargement of the vas deferens right near the urethra, where we're dumping um, our sperm into the urethra, is called the ampulla. And sometimes the structure can add uh, different materials to the ejaculate in some species. All right, so the urethra is separated into um, a couple different regions. You've got the pelvic region. This is where all your accessory reproductive glands are going to be. These glands are going to add material to the spermatozoa, um, fluids and such that are going to um, mix with the spermatozoa and produce your final product which is uh, semen. Um, you have the penile portion which runs the rest of the length of the penis and then your, your urethra is common passageway. Right? Urethra carries both urine uh, and semen out of the body. When ejaculation is occurring urine flow into the urethra is temporarily blocked um, so that obviously just spermatozoa goes in there. We don't want um, a mix of uh, semen and urine. Um, semen is just your spermatozoa plus any fluids or secretions from your um, accessory glands. Alright, couple, couple quick notes on the accessory glands. Um, very different depending on what species you're talking about, which glands are present uh, plus the structure of these glands. These pictures are from your book. Um, a would be um, this region from a stallion, B being a bull, C a boar, and D a dog. Um, you can see the dog only has uh, the prostate. It doesn't have seminal, seminal vesicle uh, or a bubble urethral gland. Um, we'll talk about that a little more in another slide. A lot of these glands will produce alkaline fluids uh, to mix with your spermatozoa and become portion of the semen and this is really important because it helps neutralize the acidity of the female reproductive tract. It gives the spermatozoa a little bit of protection from that uh, acidic environment. So the accessory reproductive glands, uh, one being the prostate gland, this usually sort of encapsulates a portion of the urethra, has lots of ducts that come off it uh, to join the urethra very large in dogs because it's the only accessory gland that they have. The bulbal urethral gland, also known as the Cowper's gland, it's not pictured in this picture because this is of the dog and they don't have one, um, but this secretes a um, mucus, a uh, very mucusy fluid, and this is going to help um, clear out, um, so it kind of flushes the urethra um, of any maybe any urine and such there 
um, and also lubricates the urethra for uh, gentle semen transport along the way. Alright, so the uh, male organ that's going to um, supply semen into the reproductive tract of the female is obviously the penis. It's composed of muscle, erectile tissue, and connective tissue. Some species differences here. Some species have uh, more connective tissue than erectile tissue. We'll talk about that um, a little bit as well. Lots of nerve endings in the end of the penis and lots of blood supply. Right, three parts of the penis. You've got the roots, the body, and the glands. Uh, roots just attach um, with connective tissue the penis to the pelvis. Um, the body is going to have um, a lot of your erectile tissue. Rectile tissue um, has is connective tissue with lots of blood sinuses. Sinus being obviously an open space like we've talked about in the past. These sinuses are going to fill with blood and as they engorge with blood that is what actually causes uh, the erection. The glands is the very very distal portion of the penis. You can see it in your male reproductive uh, tract diagram from the title slide and that's located in a couple other places in this lecture. Um, has lots and lots of nerve endings. The prepus is a skin layer that covers uh, the distal portion of the penis um, when it's not erect and then when erection occurs the penis um, protrudes from the prepus. There's a nice mucous membrane uh, lining on the inner part of, of the prepus. Alright, canine penis is a little different from some other species. We talked about this back in the chapter 6, the skeletal system. It, has, um, it actually has a bone within the penis called the os penis. Uh, on the, along the ventral side of the bone, there's a canal in which the urethra will run through. Um, a couple other um, you know, non-domesticated species, the raccoon, beaver, and walrus, also have um, this bone in the penis. The canines also have the bulb of glands, which is um, some specialized erectile tissue that does fill with blood during the erection per usual but it fills very slowly and fills over time by the time it's fully engorged and filled um, the blood sinuses usually copulation or ejaculation has already occurred by this time but the filling of this area um, keeps the male and female tied um, together for a little while after ejaculation has finished um, that's why it's important not to separate animals uh, or dogs after breeding because um, you can actually cause um, injury and damage um, if they're in this um, tie period and you try and separate them. Sigmoid flexure present in some species including our bull, ram, and boar. Um, these species have um, more fibrous connective tissue than they do erectile tissue and we can see the sigmoid flexure here. It's this S shape of the penis right here and how erection occurs in these species uh, not as much to do with uh, blood sinus fill up though that is uh, that is a part of it. Um, we actually have a muscle here called the retractor penis muscle and this muscle will actually um, via contractions and relaxations can actually straighten out the penis during erection when stimulation occurs and the sigmoid flexure is going to straighten out and the glands penis will protrude from the prepus um, and that's when the animal has the, the erection and can breed with the female. Alright, quickly wrapping up the male side of things, uh, erection and ejaculation. Erection, we get some sort of stimulus trigger um, from the parasympathetic nervous system these triggers are oftentimes smells, including pheromones, or just behavioral changes in the females um, that um, stimulate this, and nervous system sends down some signals uh, for erection to occur. Arteries are going to dilate the arteries um, heading to the testes. This is going to increase blood flow um, into the testes to engorge those blood sinuses, um, not to the testes, into the um, into the penis and the testes. We're going to fill up those blood sinuses, cause erection um, in the penis. And when this occurs and blood flow is 
um, pretty heavy throughout these arteries. The veins actually get pushed against the walls and this prevents blood from just quickly escaping through the veins. So blood kind of stays down in the area for a little bit and that causes the erection to last for X amount of time. Ejaculation obviously, the depositing of the semen, releasing it from the male into the female. Um, there's some muscle contraction in the urethra that pumps semen um, out of the urethra into the female reproductive tract. Alright, speaking of female reproductive tract, here's your schematic back from the title slide. We've got um, vagina, cervix, uterus, the body and the horns. You've got your oviducts, your infundibulum, fimbriae, little projections off the infundibulum, um, ovary with, this happens to have a CL or corpus luteum on it, um, main structures of female reproductive tract um, in this schematic. All right, there's ligaments in the female reproductive tract, um, you pretty much attachment sites and also bring in um, some blood flow uh, nerves uh, over two parts of the female reproductive tract. Um, these are essentially just sheets of peritoneum. They hold the ovaries and oviduct and uterus in place and um, from the dorsal parts of the abdominal cavity. Ligaments have special names depending on what structure they're attached to. So the ovary is the mesovarium, oviduct, mesosalpinx, and uterus mesometrium. So a little more about ligaments. Um, back here on this slide, these were this is the broad ligament, and over here there's suspensory and round ligaments. Suspensories are attaching the um, ovary ends of the broad ligament to the body wall near the last rib, and the round ligaments are on each side of the broad ligament. And these are actually what are going to be cut when we're removing uterine horns during ovario hysterectomy um, surgery in our animals. So ovaries, here's a picture of an ovary. You can see multiple different follicles. You've got a tertiary follicles here. You've got a corpus luteum, usually with like a yellower color. And this is all part of the ovarian cycle going on with follicle development, um, corpus luteum after uh, ovulation has occurred. Ovaries, where we're producing our oocytes, our ovum, um, lots of variation in species, um, like just about everything else we've talked about this semester. And also a lot of hormone production, just like the male system, female um, ovaries, just like the testes, have to um, produce lots of hormones as well. Estrogen and progestins, um, your main player in progestin uh, being progesterone, which is going to be necessary during pregnancy. Um, so this is just a little quick picture of the ovaries. So a little bit about the ovarian cycle. This is when we're um, you know, growing and maturing our oocytes and our follicle so that we can eventually get ovulation where the ovum gets released to the rest of the female reproductive tract and hopefully be met by a spermatozoa for fertilization. Couple main hormones that drive this process. We've got FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone. All right, Luteinizing hormone, we talked about in the endocrine system. A surge of luteinizing hormone is what's going to be cause, cause ovulation. Eventually, after ovulation, um, we get formation of the corpus luteum, and then we'll have, I mean, sorry, I've, you're going to have your corpus hemorrhagicum first where the blood flow um, fills up your ruptured follicle, which is then going to turn into your corpus luteum. Corpus luteum will either be main maintained if pregnancy has occurred um, or regress over time if pregnancy has not occurred, and then the cycle can start back over. So primary follicles, follicles are growing. There's different stages of follicles. You get into that detail um, when you take reproduction. Uh, mature follicle in here. These little cells in here, you have granulosa cells, um, cumulus, oophorus. We'll talk about those in a couple slides. Antrum is just fluid-filled portion of the follicle. Eventually the follicle gets to the point where it's really large, has a lot of pressure from the fluid in the antrum and will rupture and that's when our ovum is going to release. All right, Ovarian cycle. How many ova are produced depends on what species we're talking about. Obviously here we've got dogs. Dogs are litter bearing species. 
So they're going to be multi-paris. They're going to produce many ova per ovarian um, cycle. However, species like ourselves, horse and the cow, usually give birth to one offspring at a time. So these are uni uniparous species. All right, ovarian cycle. Your primary follicle um, is going to have your immature oocyte um, that was produced a long time ago, surrounded by that should say layer of follicular cells. And these cells are going to be your granulosa cells. Um, follicles are recruited. Not all follicles will fully develop. Particular ones are recruited and activated, and these are the ones that are going to grow large um, and go through the entire. Um, life cycle of the follicle. So these follicular cells multiplying produce many layers of, these are your granulosa cells, I overlooked this blank, uh, but that should be um, granulosa, uh, we talk about those a lot more, so you should see that word um, in a couple places anyways. This cell multiplication starts to expand the follicle as we get more and more cells inside it to um, start the growth process. Granulosa cells are actually producing one of our hormones. They're producing our estrogens. And as the cells multiply, obviously we get a lot more estrogen produced. Right? Uh, space between your granulosa cells, that's that fluid filled space, is filled with fluid. That's your antrum. When the follicle has achieved maximum size, it's your mature follicle, also known as your graphene follicle or vesicular ovarian follicle. When it's at max size, max estrogen is produced. Um, the mature oocyte is sitting on a mound of granulosa cells. That's your cumulus oophorus from your um, picture a couple slides ago, and we'll revisit that picture next. And it's also surrounded by a thin layer of your granulosa cells called your co corona radiata. So back to our picture of the ovarian cycle. Follicle is growing. Here we've got our antrum fluid-filled, cumulus oophorus, the granulosa cells that the uh, oocytes sit on. When the follicle ruptures, the ovum is released um, with the cumulus oophorus and the corona radiata. Um, it's going to be caught by the rest of the female reproductive tract, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. When the follicle gets to large enough size, the wall of the follicle is going to weaken, and that's going to cause it to rupture. And that's when we have ovulation. At ovulation, when the follicle ruptures, the antrum fluid is going to rush out. It's going to actually carry the ovum over to the oviduct. All right, the ruptured follicle is going to fill with blood. It's going to rapidly fill in and clot. And that produces your corpus hemorrhagicum. Um, ovulation, obviously, we've said this many times at this point, caused by a surge of LH. Um, your corpus hemorrhagicum eventually... Um, the granulosa cells will line that and start to multiply and uh, start to form the corpus luteum uh, via the corpus hemorrhagicum. Some species are actually induced ovulators. They don't ovulate until um, breeding occurs. So when breeding occurs, that will stimulate ovulation as opposed to ovulation usually occurring um, at any time as soon as the ovarian cycle is ready for it. And then if breeding has occurred, uh, semen or spermatozoa can meet that egg. Um, in these species, the cat, rabbit, and ferret, they won't ovulate until breeding actually physically occurs. So the corpus luteum is formed right after the corpus hemorrhagicum. Granulosa signs, granulosa cells lining that corpus hemorrhagicum, they divide and multiply, like I said on the last slide, results in formation of the CL. Uh, influenced by high levels of luteinizing hormone, um, so LH. And the function of the corpus luteum is to maintain pregnancy. So the corpus luteum is maintained if um, fertilization, fertilization and implantation occur, thus having pregnancy. Um, CL produces progestins, uh, primarily talking about progesterone itself. Um, and endocrine system sends signals that pregnancy has occurred um, for the CL to be maintained. All right, a little bit about the oviducts, um, also known as the fallopian tubes or uterine tubes. These are essentially the extensions off of um, the uterine horns. If you look back at your um, overview picture of the female reproductive system, you've got your ovarian horns, and then you have a thinner tube structure coming off of those. Those are going to be your oviducts. At the end of that, 
you have a wide opening called the infundibulum. And this is actually going to catch the ovum when they're ovulated. Um, Fimbriae are, if you look closely at that picture, you can see finger-like projections off of that wide um, infundibulum. And those finger-like projections um, actually feel around the ovary and um, find where like the follicles are as they're developing and make sure that the infundibulum is in good position um, to quote unquote catch um, the ovum at, as it is ovulated um, when the follicle ruptures. The oviduct itself made up of lots of smooth muscle fibers um, also has some cilia and both of these structures in concert work to move the oocytes uh, I mean, move the ovum down to the uterus. Right? The oviducts are actually the site where fertilization will generally occur. So, um, spermatozoa have made the journey throughout the reproductive tract and will eventually um, generally meet up with the ovum here in the oviduct uh, for fertilization to occur and then will be moved down to the uterus. Uh, before spermatozoa can actually fertilize, um, the ovum, they have to undergo a process called capacitation and this is basically your enzymatic um, enzymatic reactions that get the acrosome to the point where it can actually penetrate um, the wall uh, of the ovum for fertilization. Alright, the uterus is just a hollow muscular part of the female reproductive tract. Um, it has a Y shape um, so you have uterus here. This one it's curved over, so um, the Y looks a little different from a normal Y. But you have a base here, your uterine body, and then branches of the Y go off into the left and right um, uterine horns. There's multiple layers of the uterine wall. Endometrium um, is going to be your innermost layer. It's going to have some simple columnar epithelium, secrete a lot of mucus um, at this part of the reproductive tract. Myometrium. Um, in the middle, some smooth muscle um, are going. That's going to help um, expel the um, offspring during um, during parturition. And the uterus is also going to help form the placenta. Our placenta is very important. Surrounds the fetus during development, during pregnancy. Um, also helps give the site of oxygen and blood supply um, between the mother and the developing fetus. Right. The uterus will force the cervix open, its muscular contractions during parturition, um, so that the um, offspring can be expelled through the cervix, which is generally in a closed position, as you can see, um, a fairly closed position, as you can see here in uh, this schematic. The uterus, the uterine body, if we're doing artificial insemination in our cows, that's where we want to deposit the semen so that semen can go, in theory, 50% down each horn. Cervix is just your smooth muscle sphincter located between the um, uterine body and the uterine and sorry and the vagina down here. All right, so cervix right here. Um, usually, it's pretty tightly closed. The two times where this closure would be relaxed would be during breeding, right? So that uh, semen can make its way over to the uterus and eventually over to the oviduct for fertilization, and also during parturition, right? Because we're expelling the fetus, um, giving birth, so we need that um, to be relaxed and open. All right, last two structures I think we'll talk about here, um, vagina and the vulva. Vagina um, is just past the cervix, um, more towards the external opening uh, of the female reproductive tract, uh, just the muscular extension um, off of the cervix. The vulva uh, has the vestibule down where the urethra opens at the ventral um, portion of the vulva. This is where um, urine will come into the female reproductive tract just near the exit of the female reproductive tract. Um, also the clitoris and labia are structures um, located within the vulva. Alright, I think the last thing we're going to finish up with here is the estrous cycle. 
Um, in the female, the estrous cycle varies um, amongst species um, quite a bit. There's four basic classifications of estrous cycles amongst species. You've got polyestrous um, species in which the estrous cycle consistently cycles um, throughout the year um, as long as there's no pregnancy. So the cycle is going to go, there's no pregnancy, the cycle is going to restart right, right up again um, and go on again and again and again until um, pregnancy occurs or obviously some sort of um, problem or defect um, disrupts this cycle. Examples of this could be the cow and the pig, uh, talking about animals. Um, another example is our seasonally polyestrous animals. So these animals are only going to cycle during particular seasons throughout the year. Um, this includes your horse, sheep, and cat. Diestrous um, species are those that cycle twice a year. Die meaning two. Um, so twice a year cycling, those are going to be your dogs. And monoestrous, those that actually only cycle once a year. Uh, examples of this being the fox and the mink. So the estrous cycle is essentially the entire time period between um, when the animal is in heat once and they're in heat the next time. All right, five stages throughout the estrous cycle. Um, only some species have the fifth stage of an estrus, but um, four main stages: proestrus, estrus, metaestrus, and diestrus. Some species also have anestrus. FSH and LH levels control these. Um, stages of estrus and the cycling. You're going to talk about um, hormone feedback loops and which ones are high, which ones are low at various times in reproduction in quite a bit of detail so we won't harp on it too much right this second um, but be prepared to get into a lot more detail um, as you head into that next semester or next year. Uh, it's actually pretty important if you look at your textbook um, your textbook for this class when you take reproduction you have a textbook of the same exact size for just reproduction anatomy and physiology of reproduction so one chapter here we're barely scratching the surface of what you'll hit um, in the next year or two alright going through these cycles proestrus basically a lot of follicular growth and development All right, estrogen production is increasing as a follicle grows. Um, linings of most of the female reproductive tract thicken and there's actually epithelium of the vagina. They actually keratinize and form a tough keratin layer on the surface and the purpose for this is um, the animals getting near to the point where they're in heat so there's a lot of potential for breeding to occur um, so forming a nice tough keratin layer uh, of the vagina that's where um, the penis is going to enter the female reproductive tract this is going to um, help avoid damage or injury um, to the lining of the vagina. Estrus is our next cycle after proestrus. This is when the animal is actually in heat. Important to note the spelling here. Estrus, E-S-T-R-U-S, is the stage. E-S-T-R-O-U-S is the cycle. All right, this is an example where spelling absolutely counts because you're talking about two different things when you have or don't have the O in the word estrus. During estrus, estrogen is at its absolute highest. At the end of this, we're going to have ovulation with that LH surge. And those induced ovulators we talked about a while back, um, they're going to stay in estrus until breeding occurs, right? until they're actually induced um, for ovulation at the end of estrus. Metaestrus, right after this, this is where we're going to develop the corpus luteum and progesterone, um, which is produced by the CL, is going to halt further development of the follicle um, just in case pregnancy does occur. Uterus is going to be prepped for implantation of a fertilized ovum if this occurs. Um, and the epithelial toughening of the vagina regresses because breeding at this point has already occurred if it was going to occur. Diestrus. Um, is when the corpus luteum is at maximum size. It's going to be retained at this stage if pregnancy occurs. If there's no pregnancy, the corpus luteum is going to uh, degenerate or regress um, and signal the end of diestrus. 
Right, that's when we'll cycle back into proesters, or in some species, going to anesters. Anesters um, being the point um, during the estrous cycle where ovaries are inactive. No follicle development, no nothing going on. Um, this is going to happen in all of your species except for the polyesterous ones. Polyesterous animals are cycling constantly, um, all the time as soon as the cycle ends. They're starting the next cycle. But your seasonally polyesterous, um, your diesterous, you know, after their cycle, they have a dormant period where nothing's going on. So this is going to be your anesterous period. All right, that's just about it. So here are some sources just for some of the pictures um, that weren't pulled offline um, from your textbook as well as Pathways to Pregnancy and Parturition book. Um, which you'll eventually use for reproduction. Um, information, pictures coming from there. That's the end of this lecture for reproductive system. Hopefully this mimics exactly what we, we should have gotten Thursday morning. Apologies for that. Once again, it wasn't really under my control, but hopefully you guys, if you decided to watch this, you get something out of it. You're going to have um, a quiz based on this uh, yeah, based on this chapter as we move forward um, over the weekend. I'll give you guys plenty of time. I'll probably give you guys through the reading days to do so. I'll make an announcement on Sakai um, quiz. I think it's important to have it on this chapter because that'll give you an idea of some sort of multiple choice true false questions that can come from this for your final exam. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed listening to me without having to look at me. Um, I know I sound stranger than I normally do on the microphone, but hopefully this worked out well for you. Any questions? email me, I'll post office hours, um, and we'll talk about this chapter during review sessions as well. Alright, thanks guys. Enjoy studying.